deep when the river's high. Ring of rushes. The waters of Bregasland are dark at the best of times, but as the spring equinox departs, the life that comes with the new year continues to flow through the creeks, burns and streams. It pools in the lake, and the ponds, apart from those dead meres in grey fens where nothing grows. Even this potent spring magic, it seems, is not enough to touch those barren waters. The rivers of life fill everyone in the territory with vitality, removing the risk of infection from the swamps and ensuring that every mouthful of fresh water has almost the same efficacy as a pot of Tom Drake's tea. The strong reeds spent the last three months lying low, passively resisting the Yotun invaders of Bregasland and moving among the Bregas in secret. After the spring equinox, that all ends. The reeds rise, armed and ready, keen to make war on the invaders once again, regrouping at Ottery with the Bounders and the Tusks. Shortly after the spring equinox, the marcher armies are reinforced by the Imperial Orcs, the Winter Sun, empowered by a potent autumn enchantment of their own to make the long march north from Segura. The Tusks also wear the mark of Imperial magic. The supernatural clarity that they possess will come in very useful in the months ahead as they navigate the shifting byways of Bregasland. Imperial magicians have also raised protective enchantments over Ottomire and the Rushes, and the night magic that infuses the marshes offers sanctuary to the Imperials while bedeviling and confusing the invading orcs. The Imperial forces gathering at Ottery are supported by a smattering of independent military units, and all told, there are perhaps 20,000 Imperial troops in Bregasland. They are opposed by an estimated 30,000 Yotun and an unknown number of splendid elfin knights drawn from the fields of glory, their golden armour and crimson standards miraculously untouched by the mud of the marshes. The Orc armies seem to support the Yagara under the command of Matilda Fisher, but this is clearly a political fiction. It is the Orcs that do the lion's share of the fighting, for all that the Yagara are at the forefront of each advance. After a season of cautious manoeuvring, both sides have roughly the same goal to drive their opponents out of Bregasland. Among the Dead Pools Empire and Jotun clash first in the Grey Fens, the deepest, darkest parts of Bregasland. Before the winter solstice, the Empire made some headway there, and they seek to capitalise on their gains. The Imperial armies take a cautious approach to the conquest, gently testing the Jotun before committing their forces. The Tusks take the lead, pushing west out of Ottomire, ensuring that the marcher soldiers avoid risky engagements and withdraw from any confrontation that would lead to unnecessary loss of life. The strong reeds are behind them, consolidating whatever gains the Imperials are able to secure, ensuring that the larger Yotun force don't manoeuvre them into a vulnerable position. Meanwhile, the watchful bounders do their best to trick the Yotun into withdrawing, striking at their flanks and exploiting every opportunity to deliver stinging blows calculated to slow their advance and to make them slip back into defensive positions in the face of the Imperial advance. Behind the three armies, the Imperial orcs provide a solid bulwark and despite the labours of their forced march, they provide solid support to the three human armies. The Yotun tactics, by comparison, are significantly less subtle. They strike down out of the north fens like a thunderbolt, a fell hammer roaring with the lust for battle and conquest. The orcs, under the banner of the Mandala's roar, lead the way, with Matilda's Yagara hot on their heels. 
the other Yotun armies follow in their wake, barely any less driven to the fray, an overwhelming assault of orcs seeking victory at any price. The strategies of the two forces are in direct opposition. The Imperials seek to gain territory with as few risky engagements as possible, while the Yotun actively hunt opportunities to clash with the strongest of the Empire's champions. And, unfortunately, the risks the Orcs are prepared to take reap dividends especially with the disparity in size between the two sides. While there are some initial gains, the marcher advance into Greyfen slows in the face of the irresistible force the Yotun bring against them. Slows, then stalls. Stalls, then beginning to turn back. The Yotun orcs and the Yagara pawns are able to push the marchers and their imperial orc allies out of Greyfen altogether back into Ottermeyer, with the enemy hot on their heels. The Battle of Ottery. The Imperials fall back as slowly as they can, always probing the Yotun for any opportunity to stem their advance. Fighting in Ottermeyer is a very different proposition to fighting amidst the dead pools of the Grey Fens. The night magic that weaves through the marshes here offers succour and sanctuary to any Imperial soldier who needs it, hiding them from the Yotun and allowing them to more easily flank the advancing orcs, something that the Bounders in particular use to great effect. There are also unexpected allies here. In addition to the Bregus households that take up arms to help defend their homes, there are angry pikes that lunge out of the waters ready to tear off the leg of an unwary orc warrior vicious black conger eels that rip chunks of flesh from exposed limbs and emaciated lantern luggers who emerge from the deep waters when the sun sets to lure unwary Yotun to a choking death in the hungry quagmires. The enchanted marshes give the imperial forces a chance to regroup at Ottery, gathering in the shadow of the little town's low walls for the second time in the season. There's some idle talk that the orc advance may have spent itself in grey fens, but the dower bregas are not so optimistic. Whilst the bounders harry the orc lines, the empire prepares to try and strike back against them. The people of Ottery are Bregus through and through, and while some openly offer aid to the marcher armies camped around them, others are more reticent. There's no overt hostility, but it's clear that not everyone has turned a deaf ear to the lies of Matilda Fisher, self-styled steward of Bregusland. Nobody says anything outright, but on the night before the orcs arrive, a number of Ottery folk gather in the town square and march on the eel farm of the prosperous Pete household, banging pots and shouting, visiting them with rough music. By the time the procession arrives, most of the Pete have already fled, and the fact that they head north through the marshes rather than east along the Ottaway provides more than enough proof of their treachery to the angry mob. The clamour of the rough music is like a prelude of what's to come. When tens of thousands of Yotun begin to appear through the seething morning mists the next day, drums pounding, horns blazing, 30,000 orc voices raised in a hymn to the Faithir that they believe will carry them across the howling abyss if they die a hero's death. A death the Empire's armies are more than prepared to offer them. The Imperials allow the Yotun no time to set up camps or secure defensive positions, sweeping out of Ottery to harass the Yotun lines before dropping back to the limited safety offered by the town walls. There are multiple pitched battles in the sodden farmlands around Ottery, bloody engagements among the eel farms, fisheries and flowering rush crops. Many of the Bregas folk fight back, others lay down their arms and accept the inevitable. They would rather take the pragmatic choice to be Yotun thralls than be driven off the lands that their families have worked for for untold generations. These skirmishes are just a foretaste of what's to come, as the Yotun force pulls itself together like water pooling around a stone. 
the sheer weight of numbers coupled with the Yotun enthusiasm for battle again gives them the advantage. The battle rages around Ottery itself. The Yotun seem more interested in engaging the Imperial armies than seizing the town, at least to begin with. Since the Yotun first invaded Bregasland, the Marcher folk have not been idle. Fine upwalled wood imported from along the Ottaway and from Odd's End has been put to good use constructing barricades and spikes. Several households have intentionally broken centuries-old dams and flooded parts of their own lands, creating dangerous hazards and obstructions for the Yotun. The orcs are much less familiar with marsh fighting than many of the soldiers they're facing, and imperial night magic compounds their confusion. One particularly zealous band of glory-hungry Ulvenvar charge through what they think is shallow water, only to discover a morass of sucking mud that holds them in place long enough for pike-wielding marchers to butcher their entire unit. The barricades provide excellent opportunities for Bregasland beaters to launch volley after volley of arrows into the Yotun as they manoeuvre around the treacherous battlefield, before fading back into the welcoming mist that persists well past midday. In the end, though, the Yotun are victorious. Under a hail of withering fire from marcher archers, the Mandala's roar charged straight at the western gates of Ottery, with Fisher Yagara in the van. The gates hold for nearly half an hour before the Yotun, wielding a great rune-carved tree trunk that they've apparently transported all the way from Hordland, smash the doors and pour into the town. Everywhere the Imperial soldiers are forced to give ground and the chances of the Empire holding Ottermeyer seem to go with them. A lone horn sounds the retreat, cutting through the tumultuous roar of the battlefield. The Imperial forces withdraw. There is a breathless moment, a lull in the battle, during which they must decide which way to go. East, along Odd's Way to Odd's End, and the safety of Mitwold, or South along Sallow Walk to Sallow, and the uncertain sanctuary of the Rushes. Past Sabby's Mound, the Imperial forces retreat south. There is never really any question. Past Sabby's Mound, fighting a disciplined retreat. The Yotun do not let up, but at last their energy is starting to wane. It seems for a few days that the Empire might still hold them, might still manage to hang on to some of the southern villages and farms, but as the summer solstice approaches, it becomes clear that this is a vain hope indeed. The Marcher and Imperial Orc armies have no choice but to keep to Sallow's Walk all the way to Sallow. The Otun do not pursue. Once it's clear that the Ottomire is theirs, there is a subtle and unpleasant shift in the nature of the magic that shrouds the fens. No longer does it protect Imperial soldiers against the Yotun. Quite the contrary. The mists of Ottomire are no longer allies of the Empire, and it is just as well that the magic will fade with the dawning of the summer solstice. Imperial tactics, the spring magic that lies over the territory, and the fact that the Yotun strategy was to overwhelm the Imperial armies and merely slaughter their soldiers has helped preserve Imperial lives. However, in spite of all of this, nearly 1,500 soldiers are left behind in the mud of the Grey Fens and Ottomire. The Yotun have also suffered with well over a 1,000 casualties, while the Imperial strategy was to avoid costly engagements wherever possible, the risks the Yotun have taken in their disregard for the dangers of the marshes have cost them dearly. With Ottermeyer lost, Bregasland falls to the Yotun. Matilda Fisher declares herself the steward of Bregasland and calls on all Bregas to support her new independent nation. Imperial successes such as that gained by Imperial heroes at Dankmere during the spring equinox, as well as the exhortation of the March to Assembly, mean that most Bregas see Matilda Fisher and her Yagara as pawns of the Yotun. 
On the other hand, she is very persuasive, and there are still a few of the smaller households of the North Fen and Grey Fen that have chosen to throw their lot in with the returning steward. The vast majority give her short shrift, however. The Yotun are still giving Bregas who fall to them the choice, but they're framing it in terms of serving the steward of Bregasland, and it's reported that the orcs often forget to use the correct title and refer to her as the Jarl of the Bregas. Exactly how many people have genuinely fallen for Matilda's lies is impossible to say, if only because many Bregas would rather knuckle down and become thralls rather than be thrown off their lands or killed. Game information. While the Rushes and Graven March remain in Imperial hands, Bregasland is now a Yotun territory. One impact of this change is that it'll no longer be possible to enchant the territory with dripping echoes of the Fen from Anvil. A number of Bregas have moved south to the Rushes and Graven March, where many of them have been grudgingly taken in by the Marchers there. Many more, however, have stayed behind either as thralls or are hiding in the marshes. At this time, there's still a sizeable population of marchers in Bregasland, and no sign that that situation is going to change anytime soon. The conjunctions for this particular Wind of War have not yet been published, and all of the conjunctions for the Wind of War will be published at a later date in their entirety.